Hello Annie and everyone at the conference. And I very much wish I was with you now. But thank you for allowing me to say a few words about the Beckley Foundation, which is a charitable trust I set up a number of years ago with two main aims. One, to investigate consciousness and its altered states. And the other is to address the problem of global drug policy. Everyone agrees that it's not working, um, it's not achieving its stated aims and it's causing massive unhappiness on the way. Worldwide, over 90 million people are imprisoned for drug-related offences, over 500,000 of whom are in the USA, where, ironically, the cost of keeping a person in prison is more than the room, board and tuition at Harvard. For all the hundreds of billions of dollars spent annually on enforcement, the world is awash with psychoactive substances. They have never been cheaper, purer or more available. The Beckley has three main programmes. One is the science programme, second is the seminar programme and third is the drug policy programme. Uh, the aim of the Beckley Foundation is to do cutting-edge neuroscience about consciousness and its changing states, whether brought about by meditation, um, chanting, deep breathing, um, psychoactive substances, how they correlate and change by using the very latest technologies, EEG, MEG, MRI, and different ways of identifying what is happening under the subjective experience. We work with top scientists in, in the field. I'm very lucky to have a very distinguished board of scientific advisors, Albert Hoffman, Sasha Shulkin, Colin Blakemore, who's Chief Executive of the Medical Research Council here in England, Dave Nichols, Professor Ramachandran. I very much like working with the very established institutions in order to give the subject the full credibility that it needs. The good news this year is that we've got the full permission to do research with LSD and human subjects. The first LSD study which we've got going will investigate the dose relation, so there'll be two doses in a placebo, and the neural correlates which change with the different experiences. The second phase will be moving into MEG and MRI to observe changes in um, blood supply, neurotransmitters, and getting a better, deeper understanding of how it alters consciousness, mood, cognition, creativity, and uh, the things about humanity that we value. This is actually the first study since Prohibition stopped all research into the use of psychedelics more than 30 years ago. It's the first study to get permission uh, to study the effects of LSD in human subjects. And I'm very much hoping uh, it will open the doors to an orchard rich in ripe fruit for the plucking. And it already seems to be happening because I've got several other institutions interested in um, working out protocols to do with the research into LSD, uh, one looking at creativity and its changing states, another into the psychopharmacology, and uh, another in Europe looking into the changes in cerebral circulation, which has always been a topic I found extremely interesting. The hypothesis that underlying the changes in consciousness brought about by the meditation or um, psychoactive substances, chanting, falling in love, or any other technique, is an expansion of blood to the brain capillaries, so that suddenly we have millions more brain cells combusting simultaneously, which widens the field of connectivity and increases perception. And I'm hoping very shortly that we'll solve some of these problems and thereby enable us to understand more fully how uh, consciousness is altered and enhanced.
Another part of the Beckley's scientific program is the study of cannabis. Um, amazingly, in all the studies which have been done, no one has concentrated on investigating what are the neurophysiological underpinnings of the experience that people find beneficial. The UN says 200 million people use cannabis worldwide. What are the benefits that come from its use and what is the um, underpinning of these benefits? So this first study is I'm um, doing with um, Professor David Nutt, Bristol University, who's a world-renowned psychopharmacologist. And we are looking into the changes in blood supply, neurotransmitter, the GABA, glutamate. Why is it that some people are anxious with the use of cannabis and some people use it as a, a suppressor of anxiety? It, is that dose related or is it due to individual differences in biochemistry? In this study we're going to use a vaporizer so that one gets the whole product as opposed to just using the THC which gives a false picture and getting a population of people who are very happy to be in the rather unpleasant um, MRI machine for further studies and make machine which isn't so unpleasant. In the scientific program um, there are basically two other major topics which we're researching. One is meditation and that's very exciting. It started with a pilot study of a very high level meditator, Sister Genti, who I asked to come to a med machine, the great big, the modern, and most kind of recent machine in the nursery of neuroscience. And she was asked to meditate for 20 minutes. She said she had one of the most um, high and beautiful meditations she'd had for a very long time, being filled with the light of love and mystical experience. So we got a snapshot of that state of her brain, which was very fascinating. And what it showed was desynchronization in the motor and sensory parts of the brain, and an amazing increase in gamma brain waves in the cerebellum. It went up higher than anyone had ever seen, strangely. And in the right cerebellum, I think is a very under understood part of the brain, and uh, certain other um, experts agree with me, it's not just the part of the brain which does automatic functioning, it's a very low, deep, and in a way I find it rather beautiful that the deep mystical experience would be registered in that part of the brain. And I think this is the first study to ever show that, because um, it's the first person probably who's ever had a mystical experience in a make machine. From this has come now a new um, development of collaboration with a very interesting group of scientists. And the plan is to design, to um, take EEGs and MEGs of a large population of people who have these experiences and then design a brain com computer interface machine. In order to do this, one needs to map the brain of high-level meditators through EEG and MEG, and then create a biofeedback for the novice meditator so that they can identify with the brainwaves of the high-level meditator and thereby achieve a higher level than they would normally. Another project is one we're doing in Russia, St. Petersburg, with a leader pioneer of cerebral circulation, Professor Yuri Moskalenko. He is a specific expert on cerebral spinal fluid dynamics. I'm also very interested in researching the use of psychedelic as an aid to psychotherapy. And there are various projects around the world which we are helping sponsor. One under um, design at the moment is with MDMA and uh, the reconciliation of war. And also I'm very delighted to be associated with Roland of Griffiths' brilliant research at Johns Hopkins to do with the use of psilocybin and the spiritual experience. P
Peter Gasser, who is in the process of getting permissions to do research into LSD as a palliative care to help with the anxiety of dying. I feel that in England it's getting a little easier, the concept that we could do research here, both in psychotherapy and neuroscience, using these um, incredibly exciting and important molecules. Uh, I think this is partly due to the Beckley Foundation seminars, which um, I've been organising for five, six years. At these seminars come important people from around the world, where they can discuss in complete privacy. They can discuss these topics without fear of being censored or repeated. In 2005, there was a seminar at the House of Lords, which was about global drug policy and how it affects um, scientific and medical research. And that was chaired by Colin Blakemore, and it had a very distinguished um, participant list, including Bob Schustek, director of NIDA, and many other important scientists. And they all agreed that this research needs to be opened up. So I think if we go ahead in the most careful, cautious way, in the best design protocols, and making sure that no accidents happen. Um, hopefully, in the next five, ten years, a lot of research will take place with the aim of us understanding more about how these states come about and how they can be integrated into society and help poor, suffering mankind tackle its problems. The Beckley Foundation also had an important part to play in the development of the recent Lancet article written by Colin Blakemore and Dave Nutt about a new scale of harm, of classification for drugs. It was first proposed at the Beckley Foundation seminar in 2003. This scale would be scientifically based and would be constantly reviewed as the scientific knowledge advances. Ecstasy comes 18th on the list of harms, right near the bottom. However, it is currently classified as a Class A drug. In the UK, annual deaths from all illegal drugs is about 1,500. From alcohol, it's about 40,000. From tobacco, it's 114,000. 90% of all drug-related deaths are alcohol and tobacco-related. Now, no one's suggesting that they should be made illegal, but it's very interesting to have them as correlations to what is currently in England in Class A and in America in Schedule 1. Most people use illegal drugs with no problem to either themselves or society. It's maybe at the most 10% which become the problem users. And that 10% cause 99% of the costs to society, both in medical costs, crime costs. Rather than concentrate on eradication of all drugs, as was the stated aim of the UN, um, it would probably be more rewarding to concentrate on that 10% of problem users. No other area of government would lay down policies 40 years ago, and regardless of the fact of whether they are achieving their aims or not, continue throwing hundreds of billions of dollars at it each year. And it's really come to a point when countries need to evaluate the process, and the perfect time is at the UN Assembly, which will occur in 2008, which will review the last 10 years of drug policy and set the agenda for the next 10 years. And one of the projects we're involved in at the moment is to set up a cannabis commission which will cover all areas of cannabis from the health and how it's regulated at the moment and what are the repercussions of that to do with incarceration and use and um, how well it works and then looking at how different countries uh, interpret the UN conventions and finally examining how the conventions themselves could be amended. The Beckley attempts to work with governments 
in the sense of helping them to make better decisions by commissioning reports which evaluate the effectiveness of different policies. We also started two other organisations, an International Society for the Study of Drug Policy, which was set up for analysts and scientists to collaborate at a global level, and the International Drug Policy Consortium for NGOs from around the world to network and work together and try to work out what policies might be more effective at um, limiting harms while at the same time recognising people's personal liberties. Although it doesn't look obvious that changes are happening, I think there is a big change behind the scenes. And if we prepare information and uh, research, there will suddenly come a time when society is ready to use that research. So whatever we're all doing isn't wasted, I don't think. It's building up information for the future. And I think we're all very lucky to be involved in this fascinating area of human research. <laughs>